With the global financial system at a historic moment of total collapse, only depopulation of the most efficient means is the way the financier oligarchy can respond. In today's age, that means a thermonuclear war. However, the policy of reducing our numbers on this planet has been the model of the British Empire throughout history, and wherever they are, genocide will follow. Today, there are 12 million people at risk of starvation in the Horn of Africa, but that threat is in no way localized, as this year's global grain harvest was exactly half of what our current 7 billion global population needs to survive. It's not just a question of halting the genocide of thermonuclear war. The genocide has already begun, and London's puppet in the White House has enforced that policy globally for the benefit of the empire. All discussion of overpopulation or global warming causing uncontrollable changes in food production are a lie. As we know, there's nothing natural about man allowing himself to die in mass numbers. The natural tendency of man is to create and discover the solutions to all obstacles that he will ever encounter. To give up that view of man would be forfeiting the human race to pure evil. The policy of scaling back food production in the name of stabilization of global markets is a deliberate starvation policy that has been utilized by the British Empire for hundreds of years. Despite the open knowledge of that, what is often cited as not deliberate and out of mankind's control is the process of severe and unpredictable weather. It is true that weather has grave effects on the supply of food. However, when we already know that there are unforeseen events that will affect the food supply, we can develop the system in the immediate to deal with the crisis. Ancient cultures knew to expect periodic droughts or floods and would take precautions to the best of their ability. The people of Egypt always expected the Nile to flood and came to rely on it as a source of irrigation. In the United States, because of the long-term development of the country by those who came before us, wherever there is a crisis in one state of the U.S., another state can use a railroad, river transport, or airlift in order to bring in the necessary supplies to deal with the shortage. Hence, no American would imagine refugees thin as skeletons wandering from one state to the next. This kind of direct response to a food shortage is not a long-term plan for the development of our country, but it is a capability of defense against severe weather that we still have. That kind of preparation is necessary and basic, but more of a last line of defense than the first. Our first line of defense must be to understand those processes themselves that are the cause of anomalies in the weather and learn to fill in those parts of the process that nature won't supply. But a society where mankind is treated like just another animal, where those that are weaker than the strongest beast will be expected to die, is one in which human beings are not allowed access to such knowledge. That is precisely what the British Empire has done, is doing, and will do to the human race unless stopped. Let's take a closer look at how this operates. During the great famines that occurred between 1876 and 1906, several nations on three continents were affected. Although the British Empire, which had dominion over most of these areas, did not keep records of the number of deaths due to famine, Estimates put the number at anywhere between 32 and 61 million people globally. Putting that in the light of world wars, it amounts to as great as the number of casualties of World War II, including disease-related deaths and victims of the Holocaust. Although the British Empire was and is brutal, how could as much as 60 million people possibly have been wiped out so quickly? What we know today, and very well could have known at the time, is that three strong El Nino events took place between 1876 and 1906. The effect was drought that decimated the food supply of several countries, extending from Brazil over to China, down to India, and as far west as Egypt and the Maghreb. However, human civilizations have been aware of disturbances in the supply of food for thousands of years, and had the ability to take certain precautions which included reserves and transport of food. In an age of modern rail transport and telegraph communication, why would the late 19th century death toll amount to such an ungodly number? We will shed more light on this to look at the British in India, although this does not even begin to give the whole picture of the unnecessary and brutal deaths that occurred around the world and still continue to this day. The decade prior to 1876, 
saw a sharp decline in rainfall in the Madras region of India. That year, the region which usually experienced 27.6 inches annually only recorded 6.3 inches. Madras, which today is called Chennai, gets its rain usually from northeast monsoon winds, which at the time were its only source of replenishment for irrigation. As massive failures in crops came about, prices rose exorbitantly high due to the wild speculation in food commodities pricing, which London allowed to run rampant. Grain riots ensued among a hungry and desperate population, which began digging for roots to feed on. Due to the free market dominant system of the British, any price instability in any one part of the system would be a determinant in the whole, and as a result of such practices, the world sank into a Great Depression in which the poor colonial populations suffered miserably. Regardless of the surplus of rice and wheat in the years leading up to the drought in India, much of it was exported to England. In the years 1877 and 1878, 6.7 hundred weight tons of wheat were exported to Europe by India's grain merchants at the same time as bodies were dropping in the streets. Robert Bulwer Lytton, Queen Victoria's favorite poet and head of the central government of India at the time, was described as an insane opium addict with megalomania, a term sometimes used to describe narcissistic personality disorder. Lytton was a fitting personality for the empire to employ in overseeing the deaths of millions of Indians. In 1876, as India's staple crops were withering away in the fields of the south, Lord Lytton organized a huge imperial ceremonial in order to proclaim Queen Victoria Empress of India. During the week-long feast that fed 68,000 officials, satraps, and Indian royalty, it was estimated that 100,000 Indians died of starvation in Madras and Mysore. He chose to argue in front of the Legislative Council in 1877 that the Indian population has a tendency to increase more rapidly than the food it raises from the soil. But the mass death was not only brought on at the whims of a crazy man. British officials adhered to the strict guidance of Adam Smith's invisible hand, who said in 1770 as a response to the Bengal famine, that famine has never risen from any other cause, but the violence of government attempting by improper means to remedy the inconvenience of dearth. In a later parliamentary famine commission in 1881, Finance Minister Evelyn Baring would make this view pointedly clear by saying, Every benevolent attempt made to mitigate the effects of famine and defective sanitation serves but to enhance the evils resulting from overpopulation. The same 1881 report drew the conclusion that 80% of the famine mortality were drawn from the poorest 20% of the population. And if such deaths were prevented, this stratum of the population would still be unable to adopt prudential restraint. Thus, if the government spent more of its revenue on famine relief, an even larger proportion of the population would become penurious. To illustrate the intention to withdraw and prevent aid, take the case of Sir Richard Temple, who in 1873 responded to a drought in the Bengal and Bihar region of India by bringing in one million tons of rice from Burma. This and a so-called gratuitous dole alleviated the crisis in the immediate, and according to official records, there were only three deaths as a result of starvation. This would in no way be praised as a British model for alleviating crises in the food supply, as Lord Temple came under vicious attack from London for allowing the scale of wages paid at relief works to be determined by the daily food needs of the labor, and the prevailing food prices in the market rather than by the amount that the government could afford to spend for that purpose. Temple, whose career was nearly destroyed, soon completely changed his tune and carried out the task of making relief as ineffective as possible. Temple's directive from the Council of India included the following. The task of saving life, irrespective of cost, is one which is beyond our power to undertake. The embarrassment of debt and the weight of taxation consequent on the expense thereby involved would soon become more fatal than the famine itself. Temple implemented the requirement of forcing applicants for relief to travel great distances on foot to dormitory camps, where they were forced to the coolie labor upon promise of food. In order for the Indians to receive any relief without work, they had to prove they were nearly incapacitated to carry out even the smallest amount of labor. The idea that these camps were intended to provide any sort of relief was a lie, as the laborers were given less to eat than a diet for prisoners in the Nazi Buchenwald concentration camp. 
With this effective means of killing through a slow starvation process came diseases such as malaria, bubonic plague, dysentery, smallpox, and cholera. This was not localized to Madras. These famines spread throughout the entirety of India and also around the entire globe. The 1876 to 77 famine was only the first of successive global famines in a roughly 25-year period. In addition to India, famine affected several countries including China, Russia, Korea, Vietnam, Brazil, New Caledonia, Egypt, the Maghreb, Ethiopia, and Sudan, where one third of the population perished. Another global famine ensued from 1889 to 91. And 1896 to 1902, the monsoons failed in the tropics again, resulting in another deadly string of famines. The planet has now entered what is called in by scientists and others the rim of fire. The rim of fire can be located as starting in the South Island of New Zealand going up through Indonesia, through Japan, to Alaska, coming down to California and going down to Chile. And it touches a few other areas, but this is it is prim primarily the Pacific Basin, which is a rim of fire. And no nuclear explosion organized by man could ever even approximate the power of this rim of fire. The sun has recently gone into a new phase. On March 14th, 2011, Lyndon LaRouche gave these remarks in response to the Great Japan Earthquake of March 11th. In the months preceding the earthquake, Lyndon LaRouche and his basement team had already been in discussion on the solar and galactic threats that humanity faces, a threat which is subsuming to all geopolitical earthbound crises to date. Earthquakes have monumental and sudden effects in loss of life and the destruction of entire cities and even nations. But given our examination of the British in India and the effect of that free trade policy throughout the world, we see a comparable force in the El Nino events in the Pacific that were conveniently turned against humanity by the empire. In effect, the empire turned the effects of successive and severe El Nino events into a weapon of mass destruction. In some areas affected by the great famines of 1876 to 1906, the land had been so depopulated of human life it would seem to one as if an extinction event had taken place. Shaanxi, China, for instance, was so depopulated during the 1880s, they could not return to their 1875 population level until 1953. But despite the sheer power and destructiveness of those forces driving weather, an understanding of those same processes could be the windows through which we as mankind can gain a greater understanding of the universe we live in. In addition to this, we can also gain the ability to alter those weather patterns that today may seem unpredictable and out of our control. The process called El Nino and La Nina is what we'll be examining. To understand the scope of what we would be altering, let's take a quick look at an El Nino process. Early fishermen off the Ibero-American coast recognized long before any satellite images existed that a strange shift was occurring periodically where the usually cool waters along the coast would become warm and the fish that were usually in abundance would cease to make their way to the surface. This process would often occur beginning in December and thus prompting the fishermen to give it its name, El Nino or the Christ Child. Given the instrumentation that we have today due to past advances in space, we understand this process as extending across an entire hemisphere and with effects that reach around the globe. To gain a better understanding of this process, let's look at what is happening under non-El Nino conditions. Usually the global trade winds blow towards the west across the tropical Pacific, which one can see in this model as a slow creeping motion consistently moving across the equator as if forming a belt around the globe. These are the trade winds that pile up warm surface water in the West Pacific, so that the sea surface is one half meter higher at Indonesia than it is in Ecuador and eight degrees Celsius hotter. In the east along the coast of Peru, the water is usually cold due to a process of upwelling. In this diagram, the slanted plane called the thermocline indicates the direction of the upwelling, bringing to the surface nutrient-rich water and a diversity of sea life. The east also sees less rainfall, while in the west, 
Where the water is warmer, rainfall is more common. The ocean and atmosphere of the globe are interconnected as part of one process. El Nino is described as an oscillation of this system in the tropical Pacific. During El Nino, the ocean temperature becomes abnormally high in the southeastern equatorial region, and the trade winds relax in the central and western Pacific. The thermocline becomes depressed in the East Pacific and starts to elevate in the west, cutting off the usual route of sea life to the east. As the atmospheric heat source moves east, overlaying the warmest water, large changes in the global atmospheric circulation occur, which in turn force changes in weather in regions far removed from the tropical Pacific. However, these are just effects. At this point, we still don't know what the cause of this process is, and we don't even know when one has begun until we've seen its effects. Also, what causes the anomalous warming of the ocean surface to occur as quickly as it does when we go into an El Nino phase? Could this merely be the work of solar energy? Is our lack of knowledge of what's going on on the ocean floor, but also what's going on inside the Earth, be throwing us for a loop? Without a greater understanding, it's as if we're in the footsteps of an invisible giant. If we fail to take up the mastery of such challenges, we fail to understand these processes and fall back on our simple sense-perceptual interpretations of our environment. Looking for the cause of such a phenomenon requires man to change his identity from being an earth-dwelling slave to his senses to an extraterrestrial being where the development of the human mind above all is primary. On the North American continent, we see many of the imbalances that occur on other continents where there is too much water in one region, not enough in another part. Although these imbalances are seemingly constant on a short span of history, multitudes of weather anomalies have been seen in the past year, such as increase in snowfall, tornadoes, and hurricanes which are part of indicating to us that we are currently in a dangerous part of our galaxy. There is a lot that we don't know with certainty, but the point is human life on this planet must be organized to come to understand these things very quickly, because the greatest threat to our existence is the ignorance of the universe we inhabit. The North American Water and Power Alliance is one such step to understanding our universe, which must be taken immediately. Although we would be dealing with challenges in the immediate, such as flood prevention and a steady and reliable source of irrigation, we're mastering the forces of a large portion of our entire hemisphere. Given that El Nino is a giant process that affects multiple continents, something on the scale of several Nawapas in several countries would be a major step in understanding what are intercontinental, solar, and intergalactic processes. What we do know is if we are prostrate as a society at the whim of the oligarchical tendency, the Great Famines will seem as nothing compared to what we'll face as mysterious forces from locations that are currently beyond our grasp. Just as the British Empire controlled and suppressed any of the necessary knowledge to keep people alive in the 19th century, today the same attack on humanity continues. Not only do the worst of all possible famines continue to threaten lives across the globe, but even the most advanced capabilities we have to secure ourselves against it are being shut down. It is not just a matter of will genocide occur. It is happening and it is completely unnecessary. Human beings have the ability to creatively gain a mastery over the forces of nature and begin to control weather on this planet. So the question is, are we in this world going to let the British Empire dominate us by leaving us open to the unseen power of nature? Or are we in the United States, with the power of our Constitution, going to eliminate empire and master the control of the forces of nature? With the global financial system at a historic moment of total collapse, only depopulation of the most efficient means is the way the financier oligarchy can respond. In today's age, that means a thermonuclear war. However, the policy of reducing our numbers on this planet has been the model of the British Empire throughout history, 
and wherever they are, genocide will follow. Today, there are 12 million people at risk of starvation in the Horn of Africa. But that threat is in no way localized, as this year's global grain harvest was exactly half of what our current 7 billion global population needs to survive. It's not just a question of halting the genocide of thermonuclear war. The genocide has already begun, and London's puppet in the White House has enforced that policy globally for the benefit of the empire. All discussion of overpopulation or global warming causing uncontrollable changes in food production are a lie. As we know, there's nothing natural about man allowing himself to die in mass numbers. The natural tendency of man is to create and discover the solutions to all obstacles that he will ever encounter. To give up that view of man would be forfeiting the human race to pure evil. The policy of scaling back food production in the name of stabilization of global markets is a deliberate starvation policy that has been utilized by the British Empire for hundreds of years. Despite the open knowledge of that, what is often cited as not deliberate and out of mankind's control is the process of severe and unpredictable weather. It is true that weather has grave effects on the supply of food. However, when we already know that there are unforeseen events that will affect the food supply, we can develop the system in the immediate to deal with the crisis. Ancient cultures knew to expect periodic droughts or floods and would take precautions to the best of their ability. The people of Egypt always expected the Nile to flood and came to rely on it as a source of irrigation. In the United States, because of the long-term development of the country by those who came before us, wherever there is a crisis in one state of the U.S., another state can use a railroad, river transport, or airlift in order to bring in the necessary supplies to deal with the shortage. Hence, no American would imagine refugees thin as skeletons wandering from one state to the next. This kind of direct response to a food shortage is not a long-term plan for the development of our country, but it is a capability of defense against severe weather that we still have. That kind of preparation is necessary and basic, but more of a last line of defense than the first. Our first line of defense must be to understand those processes themselves that are the cause of anomalies in the weather 